Welcome back, folks, to another episode of Business from the Bass Boat on the Serious Angler Network, presented by Rec Lending. Folks, today we've got an incredible show lined up. Do want to make mention of a couple of things here. Omnia has an incredible giveaway going on. Go check out Omnia stuff. Look at the Serious Angler Network's social media for details surrounding that. Um, in addition to that, we've got some cool stuff lined up with rec lending here in the future to talk about kind of what you're seeing a little bit in the bass boat market from uh, a dealer space from the lending space all sorts of details kind of around that so be looking out for that coming up here in the month of april and without further ado this is uh this is a cool show for me just being on the west coast or kind of fringe west i would say in idaho here but we are going to talk with the inaugural winner of the first BAM Pro Tour event. We had Mark on talking about the BAM Tour in 2024, what things are going to look like there. And so the first event occurred is in the first week of April, super kind of unique format and something I'm just ready to get into for the West Coast, what it kind of means, sort of those details. So without further ado, let's bring in Mr. Colby Pearson, the winner of uh, the first event what's, what's up, going everybody? on man? How's, it going? how's it going good man super pumped to be here uh glad to be back home that was a long drive down there to yuma arizona yeah that's the first thing i guess we were kind of chatting off air yuma is way down there i mean it's yeah. kind of it's it's the bottom of the colorado river chain is that correct does it does it continue on past i mean it's basically you know you go your your typical mead Mojave, Havasu, and then it's like a long river section, and then you kind of get way down there. Yeah, I've driven to Havasu and obviously fish Mojave and stuff, uh, U.S. Open and previous events there. Um, it was a shock to get to about Havasu and still have a couple hours to drive. I'm like, I've never been that far down. Um, I think we were 30 miles from from the Mexico border, something like that. So just super far down there, and especially coming from Oregon in the Northwest. I mean, I'm sure you know how it is, man. That's a long haul. That's a long haul. I mean, that is, that is, it's super cool. I, I don't know what I, I'm drawn to a number one desert fisheries, but the whole border fisheries, like the Martinez and then the stuff in Texas, the Falcons, like all that stuff, clear water, deserty to me is just such unique uh, in the bass fishing world. And I really like it. Um, was it that way? I mean, looking at kind of what that place is, there has, there's been events there in the past. And like, you talk to some like older West coast guys like that. There's giants in there, right? Like there's all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's the bottom of the Colorado River chain, just super cool. But but was it that way? Was it that typical clear water desert fishery kind of a thing for you? Uh, I'd say it was like a almost like a hybrid between like the upper reaches of Havasu into the Colorado River, where it's more free flowing between Mojave and Havasu mm -hmm. mixed with the Delta, because you still have some good clarity up there above Havasu. It's actually really clear. Um, what we found down at Martinez was there was some backwaters that had great clarity, maybe 10 feet or so, especially Fisher's Landing and some of the like more choked off back canals and sloughs and things. But I'd say the main stem of the Colorado is uh, maybe three foot clarity. And then a lot of the bigger backwaters, Martinez and Ferguson Lake and some of the other ones were only a foot or two clarity. And I actually made it the first two days fishing kind of a tannic colored water. So there was a ton of variables down there. It was actually unbelievable how many backwaters there were, how the conditions presented and how everyone was a little bit different. It was nuts, man. It's kind of like a jungle down there too. Super really? thick, um, not necessarily timber, but they have like cane, which almost like is leafy, like, like a bamboo shoot almost. Hmm. And a ton of reeds, um, willows, palm trees, stuff like that. Lots of stuff in the water, very cover oriented. Very cool. Very cool. And, and talking way down there the first the first thought that i had when this uh, event came out in april being that far south where did you feel like the fish were at spawn wise the first week of april on for, for you anyway yeah so i got hip to a pattern pretty early on day one that was a pattern of uh males guarding fry um, the fry that I was seeing was like microscopic. It looked like baby mosquitoes in the water. And most every angler I asked if like, Hey, did you see this going on? Like friends and stuff. They're like, no, I never saw that at all. But everywhere I went, I would find it. So I, that's just how small they were and how like, uh, minuscule of a bite pattern it was. It wasn't like super prevalent, but it definitely was there. So 
I would say that those fish probably came off bed like a week ago, just by the, it's the smallest fry I've ever seen. I mean, seriously, microscopic. Um, there was still some bed fish. I think one or two guys made top tens fish and bed fish in Fisher's Landing, which is where we put in at. Um, and then the final day, I actually found a giant on a bed, like a double digit fish um, and kind of goofed on that one. You know, mistakes made type deal, but um, like, like you had it hooked or, or we got to get some more details. I, I had her to bite, you know what I mean? She was really interactive with the bait and then I accidentally stuck the male and he was about three and a quarter. So I was like, well, I could throw him back and maybe chance that she'd come back. She had two males. Mm. So I figured that since I only accidentally stuck one, she might hang tight on the other one. And then the, the whole bed situation split up and they, they didn't end up coming back. But um, oh, fish down there compared to Oregon, like you're really far south and fish tend to grow this way instead of like in Oregon, they grow this way and this right. way, you know, right. same thing like what you experience over there. A, a 25 inch in our neck of the woods is for sure like a 10 pounder pretty much. Right. Yeah. Um, but down there, I mean, this fish that I was on, I couldn't even fathom how long it was. It was a huge fish, but it had to be a double digit, super fat, just the perfect bass. I wish I could have brought her to weigh in, but so uh, yeah, there was all, all three phases. I'm sure there was pre-spawn fish, definitely post-spawn fish. That's kind of what got me, what I got. And then there was some moving up on bed while we were there. Mm, okay. I want to dive into just because sight fishing is a, is a huge passion of mine. I, I love it. And as far as your thought process around the dynamics on, on a bed like that, when there's two males, okay, there's that debate as a tournament angler. Okay. Do I stick this fish, put it in the live well, or do I, uh, try and not stick that fish? Do I release it back to the bed when that female's there? What I guess you kind of walked through that quickly, but slowing that down, what's what is your thought process when it comes to a situation like that where there's male and female on the bed and you really want that female to go? What's what's your kind of mindset? First and foremost, just don't stick the male in the first place. Um, I was kind of like in the moment I found this giant fish, and at first when I saw it, I was like, there's no way that's a bass, like it's got to be a carp, there's flathead catfish down there. She was just suspended on a giant black spot. And then I pitched in there. She turned. I saw a lateral line. And to kind of like <laughs> put this in terms like, for everybody, these yeah. fish were like mingling. You know what I mean? When they're like really pushing each other and rolling, like it's a one pitch deal um, when they get to that level, usually unless you burn them. Um, so try not to stick the mail. I, I, the mistake I made wasn't anything in terms of execution. I rigged up a bait that had an open hook. And yeah. she turned on it and she was nipping the back half of it type deal. And then that male came over and uh, honestly, he just took it from her. He just straight up swam over. He kind of wow. knew what was going down, took it and just gutted it like bait gone forever type thing. I never even set the hook on him. He actually like literally swam to the boat and I just lifted him into the boat. There was no hook setting at all. I wish I got it on video. It was one of the few catches I didn't. Okay. Um, you know, so definitely rule one, don't stick the male if at all possible. If you have a bed with a couple males who are really, really like engaged in a big female that you really need, throw something with like a weedless hook, you know, like a flipping hook style, you know, buried, and then just jack them when it's, when she finally bites. Um, as far as letting the male go, if you have a lot of time, if you have hours and it's a fish that's off the beaten path and you can come back later, let him go and then come back later. But you also have to weigh the options of, you know, I ended up winning the tournament with like 16, 29, just over 16 right. pounds. Right. So to have secured a fish that's between three and three and a half pounds. Yeah. I mean, I kind of had to take the high road of like, well, I, I probably am going to need that fish regardless. And I really need her to set back up on the other male that was there. Um, as I've traveled through the West, I don't, find that multi fish spawning situation that often but it's crazy because in oregon i i see it pretty often really especially, it's yeah especially with really really big females like if i find an eight up here it's all she almost always has two males on her you mm -hmm. know so but when i travel i was really surprised to see that down there but yeah got it that's yeah it's interesting i, I don't see it all that often as far as in, in my experience and i i just moved from Colorado to Idaho. So I don't have, I've fished some tournaments up through here, but I haven't found many of those situations when you have two males, you see it every once in a while and it's just, it kind of throws me off. But sure. uh, th what you're saying totally reminds me last year at the Delta in a Toyota series, there was like a seven or an eight on a bed. And she had like a four pound male and same deals. Like this male was so hot and it was like, man, I got to make this decision. And it was like, I need a four pounder now. So I stuck him and yeah. put him in the boat, but it's, it's kind of a tough deal in a, in a derby when it's like, three, four pounder goes a long way. And most of the time, mm -hmm. you know, if a male's that size, so 
totally understand. That's crazy that you looked at one that big, though. I mean, that's just it huge, reminds me of like dude. absolutely the bass huge. I've caught seven double digits in my life, and like Peace. to gauge a fish that had the length like that one did, that was like I don't, I honestly, I don't know how big she really would have been. She was gigantic, and a lot of the fish there, they're really long and strung out. But like this fish was seriously. It looked like you had a Northwest fish that was like happened to be like 26 or 20, you know, it was up there. Like she was gigantic. So phenomenal wow. fishery. I mean, those guys who get to live down there, like amazing. Cool place. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's really, well, I just, I think like, I mean, I would assume those similar to the Texas fish that you're seeing in West Texas, like are those long Florida strain, right? Yeah. That are, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, that are basically like those super long, I mean, they just get so long, like you're saying, but to see one like that, but also have that thickness of like a Northern fish. That's really cool. Yeah. But sounds like a couple of guys too, were like looking at some big ones during that week. For sure. Were just, I heard of a so couple guys who rolled into some fish that were similar caliber. In fact, there was one guy in the top 10, Conrad Demex. He, uh, he told me on the final day, he's like, oh, I rolled into a 10 on a bed. I was like, was it this one? And he's like, no, yeah. it was this one. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's multiple tens on beds. Like wow. it, that place. I mean, we had a massive cold front before the event, like 22 degrees cold snap, okay. which, you know, that far South, like everybody knows that's just really going to put a damper on things. Um, it would be cool to fish that place if it was really going off. And it's got a lot of pressure this spring. I, I get the vibe. It's like oh, really? a February, March timeframe for a lot of local tournaments. And some of the local tournaments are have 70 or 80 boats. So a lot of oh, fish have been moved in the last few months there. So got it. Got it. Very cool. Well, man, I think let's talk a little bit about um, I think let's first go into your defeat, your decision to fish uh, the BAM Pro Tour this year and a little bit of the format. I think that kind of gets confusing in some ways for some people. And then and then we can kind of get into the event itself and how it progressed to kind of lay the stage. Um, so I guess starting with uh, how did you qualify for the BAM Pro Tour? What did that look like in the decision for 2024 for you? Yeah, so qualification for the Western Pro Tours, and there's been one previously that I competed in as well. I won't get too far into the weeds on it in terms of just dropping names and things, but um, 2020, I had a really strong uh, finish in Angler of the Year points for our Pro-Am circuit out here, one of them at least. Um, that circuit typically gets between 100, 150 boats. I think it was like somewhere around top 10, you know, uh, qualified for a pro tour. Um, that circuit is no longer. So essentially the way I would portray it is that Mark kind of carried the torch where we had a sure. sick opportunity out West to fish a pro tour. It was a premium entry fee event hybrid format, which is super fun. Um, no, no co-anglers, which I love co-anglers, but it's, it's fun to be on your boat by yourself with your own instincts, entirely controlling your day. Mm -hmm. Um, so Mark kind of like, uh, reinvented and reapplied that format out West. I loved fishing that previous circuit in that aspect. Um, the pay was reciprocated in a way that was, um, manageable as an angler. You know what I mean? I could keep going to events and rolling it over. I was getting good exposure and things. Um, and yeah, so it's a, a pro tour out West uh, entry fee is, is more than any of the pro amps of, of any venue. Um, so it's over the $2,000 mark type thing. And Mark's been really transparent with everything in regards to payout entry fee, everything like that. Um, we've broken down a lot of walls in that regard. Um, it used to be a little bit of like a secret society. Nobody liked that. The anglers didn't like that. We really wanted the fans and other anglers to be engaged, involved and informed. Um, with regards to that. So, you know, when Mark was able to present something that was comparable and could even be better, hopefully it is. And it seems as though it would be. Um, I was hesitant, you know what I mean? Because there's so many other circuits out here in, in past, I guess, to take that I'd like to take in my career. But once I looked into the logistics of it, looked into the finances of it, looked into the media reach aspects of it, um, it was pretty much a no brainer. I was one of the last guys to re-sign up um, but yeah, for, as far as qualification, it's kind of like a place that I've been the last few years out West. So as soon as this circuit was formed, um, I had an open invitation to go, um, based off qualifying for previous circuits that existed in the past. Mm -hmm. And then, um, hybrid format. If, uh, anybody out there watching is a fan of like uh, major league fishing, watches that live, um, multi-fish format. It's very similar to that 
we have two brackets. One is okay. weight, which everyone's familiar with, five fish weight format, and the other one's keeper count. And uh, we usually have a 14 inch minimum, something like that. So you're talking fish that are like pound and a half, two pounds. And I'll be the first one to say like, you can't target 14 inches in my opinion, that's just conventional bass fishing. Um, you're gonna catch 14 inches, you're gonna catch 20 inches. Um, so typically if you're targeting keepers, you're still applying your normal bass fishing techniques. You're not just bunting, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. So the top five anglers in keepers over the first two days would qualify for the top 10 and the top five anglers by weight the first two days also qualify for the top 10. So it's really engaging and you're pretty much always in it. You know what I mean? So if you have a bad five fish limit, but you can go catch like 30 keeper bass the next day, you still might have a shot to get in the final day. So in terms of from the angler's perspective, the pressure that I feel all day long when I'm on the water in these, these pro tour formats, it's, it's massive. And I always feel like I have a shot until the absolute last minute. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so I guess uh, how, how is that, um, taken and this was the same as a previous tour you're saying, as far as this format's very unique because it's kind of a mix, right. Of our traditional five fish tournaments and then the major league fishing catch way release situation. So in the boat, or the and the decision making that goes on so so i'm sorry the the top of the of the first two days of the tournament basically you're saying the top did you say top five in weight and then top five in numbers of fish is that correct the two, the two numbers so does it go like um what happens if you are technically in both like you went and busted yeah double qualify so the first place going into the final day angler is going to qualify by weight okay so then they take second place is going to be keepers weight keepers weight keepers weight keepers weight until they get to 10th place there will oh, be so anglers who double qualify going, sorry you're going over and over so like first is all weight yep. second would be number of keepers third is the second highest of all weight so it's like going like that precisely back. okay yep. And then like if you had a list and you started crossing names off, there would be anglers who double qualified, in which case it would be like the next guy in weight or keepers. But regardless, there'll be five for weight, five for keepers in a staggering format. Interesting. Okay. And then the and final day, the weight's zero. Then it's just right. a straight up shootout, you know. And and you snuck in, right? On that yeah, final. yeah, you I snuck in. Up. Um and, I got right. on that fry garter pattern on day one and and really kind of noticed like I could probably burn through a good population of fish doing this. And, um, so from the first 30 minutes of my tournament, the first two days I was on keepers, like just straight up, like catching as many fish as I could, as many cast presentations as humanly possible, like really grinding hard and, um, you know, squeaked in, in, in the 10th spot. So miraculously, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. That's great. So you did allude to a little bit there. Uh, you don't feel like you're out of it because say day one, you struggled, um, weight wise you could say okay i know i can go catch a bunch of smaller ones potentially or go just get a lot of bites go into another area to bring myself into this does that change your strategy i guess in an event like this i mean perfect world you've got the opportunity to catch a lot and big ones but if you're running a pattern where it's like hey i'm chasing big bites or i'm just getting bites in general with this pattern how does that like decision making way on you to decide what to do you know what i mean 100 percent um having fished these pro tours for like the last three years yeah i got a lot more intuitive deciding which one i need to kind of follow okay um as far as decision it's kind of like if, if you got big fish rolling you might need to chase them but if you can stay on those numbers then do that and you really have to like ebb and flow on the day i mean there's times that 10 in the morning i'm like i'm on keepers and there's times at noon i catch a six pounder i'm like it turns out i'm on weight and i better go <laughs> flip all day or throw a swim bait or something to catch a kicker right um, so it really keeps you engaged and in tune on the water like it, the amount of pressure in this format is massive plus there's a lot of decision making if i had caught some decent fish on day one and i did i had 18 something pounds you know um it was a real fine line between continually expanding on that keeper count or maybe going to try catch 20 pounds or something you know so um it's it's crazy man it really is and and that final day weights zero and then it's just five fish as far yep. as the, the leader exactly board. everybody's that fishing for their biggest five fish on a zero weight format and like for guys like me who qualify by keepers yeah those guys typically don't have a super strong pattern going into the final day so i totally like cannibalized everything i was on 
I couldn't get to my water. It dropped out. It was too low. I was high centering my boat on stuff. It was crazy. And mm-hmm. then I said, you know, scrap it. And I just ran and I had nothing at 10 a.m. And then, you know, got to kind of like piece the day together. And I called it like a comp day, right? Like I got comp today where I get to get paid to go fishing and let's go see what I can discover on the day type thing. So it's really engaging and intuitive instincts on the day. No, that's super cool. I mean, and and it's uh, it gives the opportunity for someone who sneaks in to have a chance to win because weights are zeroing. And now, yeah, if you made it, with the thought process of getting bites and the same kind of maybe would go like if you like if 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 it was an event to where you had a lot of bites happening and then you also maybe had some big bed fish like in my mind so long as they're not going to be necessarily taken by someone else i'd be like trying to save those for that final day knowing that it's going to be a five fish you know weight situation so that's but it's cool to be able to make that adjustment to say hey i'm all in on going to catch catch big ones now because i need to have a chance to win this you know versus yep. maybe my fry garter fry garter pattern that you were on yeah now there is pro tour events in the past where i've been so comfortable halfway through the second day of the competition that i start to go practice for the final day absolutely mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's so cool man cool well, so so another thing that's interesting about these events is the no practice for 30 days off limits, and then you are rolling into the weekend, right? And it is day one, day two, uh, day three, like potentially all no practice. Um, I don't believe there's a ride around at all or anything like you are going in blind. So it sure is enough. very sensual from, uh, from that perspective. Now, did, did guys, or including yourself, especially being something like this, Lake Martinez, way down on the southern end. If you're not from Arizona, maybe you haven't been there. Did guys go in pre-practice at all before that 30-day window? Yeah, there was some guys who got down there to go pre-practice. Again, fisheries changed so much in 30 days that it's like good for lay of the land, maybe good for like color selection pattern generally. Not that good for fish location, in my opinion. Sure. Um, so guys did get the opportunity to go practice down there. Um, but you're right, they're on the event 30 days you show up launch your boat at dark safe light cool good luck guys see you in eight nine hours and uh you run it man and no 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 ride around you know no nothing and the colorado is a pretty treacherous river to run above Mm -hmm. havasu and mojave but down below in that section it's like if you found four foot deep water in the main channel of the river like consistently like a running lane that's pretty deep like you're really shooting over some super sa- uh, shallow sandbars i saw a lot of guys get stuck oh really uh, oh yeah yeah first thing in the morning out of blast off we cut out a fisher's landing uh went up you idle through this section at lake martinez and if you go above the buoys you're stuck 100 percent. like you could push off whatever but i saw three boats get stuck on that and i only went through it once twice a day you know wow wow yeah. <laughs> That's that that would be, I guess, one negative to not having immediate practice, right? Yeah. There. Like just the sandbars will change too. I mean, it's it's so much silt and sand down there. There's hardly any rocks. There's no hard bottom barely at all. Um, it's just silt and sand. So if they get a big giant rain monsoon type deal, which they do in Arizona, you know, certain times a year, those sandbars will shift and rise and redistribute, and it's. I don't think there's like a, a map you could acquire to, to run it. It's just kind of like instinctive and just going slow and running your plot trails once you have them. Got it. Got it. Very cool. Okay. So in the event itself, days one and two, you got on like a fry garter deal. What were you using to target, target those fish? Um, how did you get on that? Were you just paying attention with your eyes? And I guess what, what did that look like for you? Yeah, so first thing in the morning, I ran out of Fishers up river to a lake called Ferguson. It's a big lake. It looks like it's like six or eight hundred acres. Yeah. Um, you know, so it can you could easily fit 20, 25 boats in there if you had to. And then I noticed that it kind of necked down and went up into like, I think it's like a bird sanctuary that in the wintertime is closed for migratory birds. Um, but I like the idea of going somewhere that maybe was closed for a couple months and it just opened about a month ago. Maybe there's less pressure, you know what I mean, type thing. So I shot up in there, um, was just trying some different baits, standard largemouth fishery stuff, buzz baits, wake baits, spinner baits, flip pitch, whatever, you know. And uh, I actually saw a fish swirl on kind of like a little reed stem. And I took note of it. And that far south, it's either like there's gizzard shad down there. So when the gizzard shad push up and spawn, they really like get crazy up on the bank, splash and stuff. And it looked kind of like that. 
or it could have been a carp or, you know, it was a large mouth garden fry. So I knew it was one of three. Um, you know, I, it did it another time. I couldn't catch this fish for whatever reason. I waypointed it and then came back like a 20 minutes later and I actually threw a floating worm at it, which is like a there technique I learned when I was like 17 in high school. I fished the high school nationals in Lake Murray and that's like a big mm -hmm. deal out there. So I twitched a floating worm and she came over and blasted it. So it's fun to catch them on something that isn't regionally exclusive. Yeah. Here. no one does that so right i was sick and then i was like boom fry garter like let's roll as soon as the sun started getting a little bit higher i started to notice those fry and then i was like okay i need to uh cover water faster it's like okay let's run this spinner bait so i ran a spinner bait for the most part on day one i caught probably maybe like 10 or 12 on a spinner bait just a tandem colorado willow standard deal um kind of like a sh clear shad color. And then uh, I did catch some on a KGB, like a Chad shad, especially mm -hmm. later in the day, you know, I, something I could throw into like potential fry garter areas and really get those fish like instigated and kind of pissed off. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't see the fry a lot of times cause they were so small. I just had to like almost like imagine where they would be stationed okay. at. Like, and if you've bass fish long enough, you know where they're gonna hold those fries back of pockets behind the little obstructions if there's a ripple and there's a little slick spot behind it in there type deal so i caught some on the chad shad pretty good and then kind of finished out day one and then um you know fast forward to day two i was sitting there in the morning and the spinnerbait bite was good and i knew i was going to go pressure the same general areas of fish so i wanted to show them something a little bit different so i actually switched to like a big double colorado that my buddy makes um mm. like big like i don't I don't know Colorado blade size, but we're talking like half dollar, like right and I'm there. fishing three foot clarity tannic water. So it wouldn't be the spinner bait that like situationally you'd select, okay. you know, but I was like, I just want something big and loud with a lot of vibration that is just going to get in their zone and I'll make multiple casts and they're going to come get it. So kind of salvaged my day two switching to that spinner bait. It was really, really key transition for me. Um, the glide bite had definitely slowed down any like simple fish to catch had been caught. Like I really put a lot of pressure in that zone I was fishing. Yeah. So the ones I was getting were like pure reaction. I was getting a lot of short bites. I hooked some fish crank into like on a square bill and I dumped every single one of them because they were just coming over and nipping it. Um, but the ones that got that spinner bait, I was fortunate enough to land, but yeah, day two transition over to a, like a big Colorado, like just thumper blade, you know, and wow. it really seemed to get them motivated. And so, so day one, what, what place were you in, uh, going into day um, two? Yeah, I was solidly in the top 10 after day one. I'd culled through so many fish. I think I caught like 16 scoreable fish, which in a largemouth fishery, like that's, that's a good day. Most largemouth fisheries out West, you know, mm -hmm. um, I was, I had 18, 22, I think is what it was. So st pretty stout weight. I think I was in sixth and I caught quite a few keepers. I think I was in third or fourth. So I was really solidly in, but I, I honestly applied the strategy of like, I wasn't saving anything because yeah. this format, the keepers compound day by day. So if I go catch 30 on the first day, my goal was to qualify in one day's worth of work. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where my mind was all day. I was like, can I catch enough fish today to ensure I fish on Sunday? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, I don't regret that at all. That's, that's a strategy I've seen guys apply successfully in these formats in the past. And that's really what I wanted to do was make sure I could punch my ticket to fish Sunday and then let the cards fall with them. Yeah. And so in your experience, especially fishing this type of format on most, and it obviously is going to be time of year dependent, but on most Western largemouth fisheries, how many keepers do you feel like you need in a two day? Like, does that, is that, does that reign true that normally if you can get to 20, 25, 30 keepers, like you're solidly in almost every time? I'd say so. It's going to depend on the fishery. I mean, you fished out here a good amount. So if you could catch like a dozen a day in a, a strong largemouth fishery, that's usually pretty good. Um, the fish out West tend to grow pretty good size, you know? So if you're calling through 12 largemouth and a lot of fisheries out here, you're going to have an 18 or 20 pound a day. A lot of times the smallmouth fisheries on the other hand, like we've seen it where it takes, I mean, probably 60 in, over the course of two days in, in order to get in on, on that keeper count. Um, there was a tournament at the Columbia two years ago. I think I had 74 scoreable fish in two days. So if that was like MLF combined, like where they're adding the weight of each fish, it would have been like 300 pounds or whatever it was, you know, 250 pounds. Um, so you really got to put in work on the smallmouth and spotted bass fisheries where the largemouth fisheries out here, there's some that are special. Obviously, certain times of year, if you had a pro tour event at Clear Lake, you'd have to have 40, you know what I mean? 50 fish. 
but typically most of these places it's like 12, 16, especially if they're kind of notated for being a little bit tough. Okay. That makes sense. And so how are you keeping track of all of this in the boat? You're solo out there. There's no Marshall or co-angler uh, yeah. associated with it. So you're putting your five big ones in the live well, I would assume, mm -hmm. right? As far as for the weigh-in goes, but then all these other ones, are you catch weigh release? What, what does that look like as an individual? Yeah. So for your biggest five, like you said, just standard operation, you know, catch them, call them, trade them, whatever you need to do. And then what you're going to do is we have like a, a catch board, which is um, just like a yellow board. It's uh, the same for every angler. They have the same board. And yeah. you're just going to take a, a photograph of that keeper fish with the minimum length, very clear mouth closed. I mean, uh, Michael Bray is the tournament director of the keeper side of things. And he's, he's strict. He's a kayak tournament director. So there's not he's not going to get you know, he's not going to let anything pass if it's questionable. Sure. Um, you're going to take a photograph with your identifier, just like in a kayak event, and then you're going to submit it to the Tourney X platform, which um, most big kayak circuits use that Tourney X platform. So it's just going to stack it for you in an app on your phone. Super easy. So catch a fish, measure it with the identifier, take a photo on your phone, and then submit it to the platform. And then it just keeps a tally. And then Michael will go in and review all of them and hopefully they're approved. You know what I mean? And then you can go on. Okay. And so does that then like, what if you don't have service? Does it update it later? Yeah. So what you do is you put them in your live well on the app. So you could just go submit. And instead of going to the leaderboard, you could store them in your live well. So the app is functional even without service. And we fish a lot of places without service. So right. in that circumstance, you have all your photos. Obviously they're backed up on your phone. They're time stat stamped. They have the metadata to pretty much prove that this is a legitimate photo, it's not a repeat of another photo, and then it's in a queue. And then after you weigh in, you know, go find some Wi-Fi, go find whatever you need, service, whatever it is, submit those fish, and then boom, it'll tally on there. And then, um, yeah, pretty much. That's awesome. Yeah, okay. it is. So, so we've gotten day one. You're sitting in a really good position. Day two, you're like, I'm going back. I know I beat up this water a lot, but I need to secure my spot into kind of day three. So you switch to more reaction style bait or something that's really going to make those fish react big bait in their face, that kind of a thing. So you make it and now it's day three and you're like, all right, I snuck in here 10th. So, so did, I guess that's a good question being 10th. Did you qualify then with weight or with numbers? Yeah, I ended up qualifying with keepers, which was my original intention. Um, I didn't think that I qualified. I was sitting in the little um, restaurant at the marina and we submitted our fish and I was just doing the math in my head. I'm like, it's like, I don't think it happened. I just don't think that I had enough to get in and talking to guys. I'm like, sounds like he's in, sounds like he's in. I was like, nah, I'm not. So I, I jumped in my truck and I drove a hundred miles. Oh, you were home. like leaving, leaving. Like I you left. Yeah. I literally at five in the afternoon, I stood up and told my buds like, Hey guys, good job see you at the next one and then hit the road and i hammered out like two hours of driving and uh my mom called me and she's like are you sure you didn't make it and i was like i'm pretty sure but if you want to sit down with a pen and paper i'll i'll uh walk you through over the phone how this is gonna go it's like okay write down the top five write down the top five in this write down a list to ten and then here's how it's gonna stagger and we got to that 10th spot i was like who's left and she's like you and i'm like you're kidding <laughs> and then, uh, so I pulled over on the side of the road and I text Mark. I was like, Hey Mark, I just drove two hours North. I'm parked on the side of the road right now. Can you let me know as soon as that top 10 is announced? And then, uh, if I need to turn around, obviously I will. So lo and behold, he sends a text like 20 minutes later, like 10th place got in. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I did the same thing at the Western shootout, which you guys were at last year. Uh -huh. um, I didn't think I made the top 10. I was driving home. So I, I work a bunch, you know, and, and I live far away from everything. So pretty much if I can't be productive competing in the event, I better be productive getting back to work. So 100%. Man, I, I resonate with that. I have some buddies yeah. who have made comments before that are like, dude, you just blow out of here when you're done with the tournament. Like, yeah, yeah. man, we got to get back to work. Like <laughs> on to the next one, dude. I'm with you. So what do you do for work in between these derbies? Yeah, I just uh, like an operations manager for uh, a retail company. So, right. yeah, definitely. It's something that I can kind of do like without a huge amount of like mental focus. Like I'm really all in on fishing and I have been for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's nice. You know, I've done that for 10 years and I can do it kind of like I don't want to say on autopilot because I still apply myself, but it it doesn't consume 
<laughs> my being at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a reason. I mean, that's something to seriously think about, though, just because when you do have when you're trying to balance things and a lot of your mental fortitude is going into something, it's hard to have enough mental ca capacity, energy, all of it for something else. So that's uh, sure. that's a take I haven't heard, but I, I appreciate Yeah, that. time, too. I mean, if I needed to get like six weeks off, you know, it's like it, it would be so hard for me to find another job like that's accommodating unless I was just to go start fishing you know, eventually full time. And that's, that's the goal, but we still got work to do. So. Sure. Sure. All right. So let's, let's get into the final day. So did you know going into that final day that you, your water was too beat up based on what you saw the second day to go back there? Or what was your, what was your mindset going into day three? I mean, you're going for broke at this point, your 10th, you snuck yeah. in. Wait, zero. Here we go. I was seeing some fish that were decent caliber, like three to four pounds. And I was like doing the math. I was like, well, if I really could make some adjustments and get those four pounders to go, I would maybe have a shot. You know what I mean? So, and I felt comfortable in the area chasing keepers. I really didn't get the opportunity to expand in all the other waters. I hadn't seen a fish at this point over five pounds the whole week or whole couple days, whatever. And, uh, so I tried to get up there and I made it like about 30% of the way in. I didn't have a single fish and the water had dropped. So between day one and day two, it dropped eight inches. And then between day two and day three, it dropped another about eight inches. So I was trying to access water that like I was fishing one to like ah, four feet deep, pretty much like, and I'm talking in the middle of these ponds, essentially be four feet deep. Wow. So losing that 16 inches of water, the way that they're kind of strung together and connected, I couldn't get my boat anywhere near where I was I actually at one point looked down to see how deep the head of my trolling motor was above the silt. And I couldn't see the head of my trolling motor because it was under the silt. Like that's how <laughs> fine the silt is down there. It's really weird. Like you can like go through situation. Um, Enter it. Yeah. So I, I just was stuck all morning getting stuck on little sandbars and berms and stuff. And I left there and I went back to that fishers where guys were kind of on that bed fishing pattern and I'd see him every day. And I was just poking around. I was like, I just don't really like, like this, you know, I don't, I don't think they're the fish to win really. And also like, I don't want to jump in. It's just, I don't like it. So I left and I started just checking off boxes. I went through some weird canal and it was weird because it was above Martinez and it just was a shoot off the main river, but okay. it like really funneled current. And it like reminded me of like the lazy river. If you've ever been to, like a theme park, it's yeah, just this yeah. giant connect featureless canal. It's like got five mile an hour current flow. And I got stuck in that for like 40 minutes. My like, God, this is a disaster. <laughs> in my boat i can't turn around it's terrible yeah yeah so i finally get out of there um and then i run all the way down to the dam which i don't know probably five miles or something totally yeah. new water start fishing uh first angler i run into is conrad demax i'm like hey dude like how's it going you know from boat to boat 60 yards away or whatever it's like oh it's good good i got a couple fish I was like i don't have any um good job you know keep it up and then Went around the corner, stuck my first keeper. It was probably like a two and a half pounder. Um, and that one was on a Chad Chad, which is cool on the final day. And then I found that giant bedfish, stuck the male, like first pitch on that. You know, I really wanted to get her, but at least I had two fish for five pounds. You know, going another backwater, um, run into Nick Cloutier. And, and mind you, these backwaters, like they're, you can't see into them. Mm. They're, they're hard to get into. I mean, it's like, they're as wide as your boat. Empty. What's that? because the cattails you can't see to get into yeah, the yeah you just can't see and plus these shoots to get in are just like they're almost like they look like giant like beaver lanes you know what i mean mm -hmm. through the brush and timber and palm trees and and they're just like two three feet deep little shoots and they're as wide as your boat like your boat's getting scratched luckily we have rat boats on both sides all the way through and you're like kind of wedging around them and stuff so went in there nick was in there you know say what's up to him and then i catch a couple fish um you know it's probably 75 acre backwater get out of there. And then, uh, maybe I had like four fish, you know, um, eight or nine pounds start running up river back up to the area. I'd kind of was comfortable. I was like, I just, I guess I need to expand up there. I had some ideas and I was just running up river and mind you, it's like two or three feet deep everywhere. So it's like treacherous to run. You're always nervous. And I just zoomed out on my GPS and I was like, dude, like what, what do you need to find to get over the edge right now? So I was thinking to myself, I was like, there's a lot of pressure lately at this fishery. There's a lot of pressure from these tournaments. I need to find something that's like a little bit more like easy to like subliminally overlook. Mm. What, what aren't guys going to? What are guys going to ignore? So I zoomed out and downstream from where I was, there was a 
channel off the river and then off of that was another channel and then there was like about four lakes off of it i was like okay like the first easiest to access lake probably gets the most pressure and then the second one's the second and the third one's the third the fourth one's the fourth because it really got to the point where it's probably like would take 15 minutes 20 minutes to access the furthest one in by idling and then by trolling in mm -hmm. so i i had time it was 12 30 so i literally flipped around mid-river ran downstream so running up zoom out of my gps somewhere i'd never been said that looks like something guys would overlook turned mm -hmm. around ran down idled up went in the first one you know probably filled out my limit maybe like nine or ten pounds totally trash limit for down there and then the next one i called up like 10 and a half or 11 pounds i got there was no wind it was about 85 degrees so it really was that first desert weather day after being there the first day was 62 and windy all day the next day was 70 right so it was the first day it really felt like fishing in the desert again the sun started to get a little bit like you know it was up and, and a little bit into the southern hemisphere so it was casting it not a big shade line i mean seriously it was like 10 inches just a little you know angle on that bank to set a shade line and i was catching fish in any black water i could find any shade so whether it was overhanging bushes or a palm tree that stuck over a little bit or whatever just a little rock it, literally it was just the tiniest little minuscule shade lines became key and I, I transitioned over to a Cinco at this point in time later in the day and I was just really soaking it out and you couldn't pick like it, it wasn't like situational where you're like that looks good that's an ambush point uh, it was not that easy and I was seeing cruisers all over and like if you even threw towards a cruiser they would like see something hit the water and just turn from 40 yeah. feet away I've never I probably never seen fish that were that they weren't skittish they just didn't care they weren't catchable they were just uncatchable you wouldn't catch them there wasn't a bait that type of situation so yeah. I finally get into that third backwater and I fish about 270 degrees around it. I fish down the whole sunny side of the bank. And finally I get on the, the Southern bank of that, you know, and with the sun, it's a little bit steeper and there's like that one foot shade line. And I'm just skipping that Cinco up underneath there. They're God, they're hard to catch. I'm doing it on a spinning rod, which really Martinez is no place for a spinning rod, but I'm running <laughs> eight because it's the only way I can get bit. And I'm just, as soon as I hook those fish, I'm just pretty much like palming my spool to try to get them a couple feet out of it. And then I could fight them like a normal fish. Cause once they got out of the brush line, there wasn't a lot um, offshore. There wasn't a lot for them to get around. Sure. Um, so I'm doing that. And, uh, let's see the first nice one i catch is like about a four and a half i throw my bait up by this wall it's sinking down you know it gets down to the bottom i just let it sit there and then my line starts to swim off it was really like a nada action you know imparting deal it was just dead stick type deal mm -hmm. set the hook sticker she jumps you know four maybe four and a half pounder so that's the first fish i have that's like boom okay we got momentum in our favor pitch back like a one and a half pounder and now we're talking like 13 and a half pounds. I'm like, okay, like it's, it's a step in the right direction. I'm two big bites away. Or if I go catch a 10, I'm 10 away, you know? Yeah. Um, so I keep going on the bank and skip my Senko up underneath like a little tiny, like desert shrub, you know, under okay. the bank and yeah. hook a fish and she comes up, wallows, throws the bait. And like, when she throws the bait, the Senko comes flying at me. And like, I kind of turn my head and I look back behind the boat. This is the craziest thing, by the way. I look back behind the boat and there's like a little tule cut and all the toolies in the back had folded over made like a tiny little mat mm. and it was like a size of a welcome mat for your house it's like a two feet deep three feet wide and it looks like it's like eight or ten inches like too shallow for there to be a bass there and yeah. i've already fished it once i fished it as i passed it i get past it hook the fish lose it wince look behind the boat and i see it and i was like gosh it just really sets up for the recipe what i'm fishing so I reel in. I go you would have never seen this this patch if you didn't have that Senko fly out. Yeah, no, I would have. I I saw it and I fished it already once. Okay, okay. But I I just happened to look back. I lost the fish and I was like, dang, like I, I needed that fish. It would have been a third of a pound coal. Like it's weight's weight, you know. Yeah, yeah. Turn my head and I look back and I just notice it again. Like second guess myself and I just see it and I'm like, God, that really fit the recipe. I couldn't believe there's one wasn't one there. Mm -hmm. So I reel in and I go to, I'm stubborn, dude. So I try to cast in front of the boat again and literally mid, mid cast, my rods loaded behind me and I stop. And then like the back of my mind, it just like reverberates. It just like, don't be lazy in my head. Like I don't talk to myself on the boat. Dude. I'm literally so focused. Like I don't even think I'm just literally grinding all day. It's like, yeah. don't be lazy. And like, I set the rod down and I turn 90 degrees and I cast behind the boat and literally the right where I cast it, 
five minutes prior, the bait hits the water in like a five and a half or six pounder, shoots out of the mat, and literally eats a Cinco midwater column and just swims out to the boat. Like, most absurd thing that's ever happened what? probably in the tournament. Like, just literally, you just see her like 21 inch fish just eats and it's just literally i didn't even swing i just had to reel like six times and then lean into her and um yeah uh, long story short that was a winning fish you know and wow. i thought i needed one more big one i was like if i get one more five plus i'll be in like the 19 20 range and that's probably gonna be stout to beat mm -hmm. but yeah dude landed that fish and uh, i love spinning gear i love finesse fishing so hooking a big one even down there on spinning gear like that's cool as a cucumber i love doing yeah. it i'm actually yeah. more comfortable catching it sounds nuts i love i'm versatile and i bass fish for 25 years and i love throwing a swim bait it's one of my favorite things in the world but i am more comfortable reeling in a giant bass on a spinning rod than most bait cast situations it's wow. as weird as that sounds um, Dude, I, I find that to be fairly common with guys uh, out west yeah. and of like like if i have a big one on a small hook i am comfortable you know i mean yeah regard minus heavy cover and stuff that that that's nerve wracking always on that kind For of sure. stuff. But like, as far as your land to catch ratio, that small hook and on spinning gear, like, man, it, it's, it's a high percentage thing when it's, when it, when it lines out. Right. Yeah. I was only using a one power rod. Like it's typically if, when I go to the desert, clear Lake Delta, that type of situation and by desert, I don't mean have I mean like Martinez desert. Um, I'll switch to a heavier braid, like a 10 pound braid is what I was running. But when I'm home, I use five, five pound braid, four to six pound braid yeah yeah wow. portland uh courtland master braid five pound um, i love it dude I've, I've not lost a fish on it i've run it for about probably three years and if you need to cast something light like pff, unparalleled that was when i was down there i was actually fishing i was like i'm so excited to get home and spool back up my five pound braid you know i had all this like 10 and 15 pound braids like rope <laughs> Bro, but, dude 10 pound braid is like what the diameter of four pounds two. six pounds like that pounds, is already yeah. tiny. so the like five so thin and i think a lot of guys buy it and they can't convince themselves to use it but uh if you got your knots dialed and you know like i'm running four thousand size spinning reels all the time oh, really five pound braid four like my five. casting distance and drag and everything's like a real system i worked on for my whole life yeah so what power when you say and i don't know enough about rods to say okay what's a one power rod is that a medium light? yeah it's just like no it's just a straight up light action wow yeah wow that is wild dude that's awesome yeah. that's cool to hear and it's and it's and it's interesting that you bump up a little bit but like it felt too heavy for you like 10 pounds. yeah i don't i mean just the performance i get out of that five pound braid is like so amazing it's really like almost like a silk when it gets that thin it doesn't have any like ridges it makes no noise it's no drag when you're casting it's literally like casting thread truly wow. all day long so I, I really like it dude and i've caught like i i couldn't tell you how many six to nine pounders on that five pound braid and wow and, and generally like, you're you're do that. I was like, but i do <laughs> what's that your leader's four to six then as far as a lot of times yeah i mean i can tie five pound braid to eight pound fluorocarbon i can't do it to 10. it's just too big of a, a discrepancy in diameter but i'll go five to eight you know a lot of times if i have to but if i can get away with six that's that's what i run a lot you know and it's just i don't pick up a spinning rod unless i need to manufacture the bites mm. i think that's the part guys don't understand like i'm not doing it for like because i'm passionate about finesse fishing i just need <laughs> bites i have to have them you know so I had to find systems and ways to hook those fish first and then land them second. And then, um, it's taken years to get dialed in, but yeah, I use seven and a half foot spinning rods. A lot of times I use super light line, super light braid and a big spinning reel, you know, put a, put a lot of pressure on those fish too. I really do. So. Yeah. Even with that five pound stuff, you, you feel. Oh like yeah. The five's definitely not the, the weak point. I, I can't in three years, I can't recall a time where I've lost a fish because of a braid failure. I've lost a fish because of a knot failure. Um, sure. There's a little bit of a learning curve figuring out how to get that thing to really adhere. Um, but yeah. you know, I'll break them off with the leader once in a blue moon. Um, sometimes I get a bad hook on them, and you know, whatever. But I don't really, I don't lose them because the braid. No, not at all. Zero times. Got it. So what knot with that thin of material are you tying for your leader knot? Yeah, a lot of guys have switched to the FG and like I just can't constitute the time that it takes. And personally, I think there's a huge there's a huge margin of error tying that. And there's a 
hardcore FG guy watching this, just like this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But that's fine, <laughs> dude. I'm I'm happy for you that you like it. I don't like it, but I just literally tie the standard old like Albright knot where I double over yeah. my leading material and I'm down six, up six. I go out the same hole I went in. I yep. tied that knot for probably 10 years, 10 or 12 years. And um, once you get dialed in, you're good to go. And the one thing I would say is if you're going to go to the lighter braids, the five pound or the eight pound braids, you have to make sure that that knot is weight bearing. And I don't mean just like getting it taut and then calling it good. Like I really try to break it. Really? And I know about oh, where that, yeah. Yeah. I'll, literally I'll put like eight or 10 pounds of pressure on it. And if it breaks, I just retie it. Mm, mm. Yeah. Wow. Well, sweet, man. Those are some awesome tips for guys yeah. uh, anywhere because I think that's too, is like the traditional bass fishing, uh, you know, over the years we've seen techniques, light line come out of Japan, come out of the West coast mm -hmm. and then kind of translate across. And I, and I feel like we're seeing maybe it just, this is anecdotally, but I feel like we're seeing maybe a little bit less of that in the last five years, 10 years, you know, I feel like stuff's kind of caught up if you will, uh, mm -hmm. as far as just finesse fishing on pressured fisheries in the east but um that's that's good advice i like it and congrats man i mean this is your first yeah. big win right as far as stuff yeah goes. first first pro tour win you know i've i've kind of like uh established myself regionally and uh, whatever's around here you know and it's been hard to connect the dots at like a professional level out west i'm you know i'm always fishing in somebody's backyard you yeah. know at the end of the day i'm coming from southern oregon i don't have a tournament fishery or a home lake so Luckily, I spent most of my younger years being really versatile and studying the bass. And the bass in Oregon don't act like the bass in other places. And that was the biggest learning curve. But now that I fish in California and Arizona and Washington, for that matter, as much as I have, it's it's a little bit easier. There's definitely a recipe, you know what I mean, where I can go apply most fisheries and get on them pretty good. Yep. Yep. That's great. That's awesome, man. Well, um, what is what is next for you? Uh, where do you feel like you want to take your career uh, from from that aspect? And also, first of all, the trophies that that Bam is 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 putting out for this that that thing is wild. How heavy Dude, is it? That? Is, it's obnoxiously massive. Yeah, that is that is a big son of a gun, which is yeah. cool. Like, everyone wants a big trophy. Like that's that's cool to hang somewhere, to put somewhere. Like that's what we're after at all this. Like it's not the money. Like we want these trophies and to to win the yes. Event. Yeah, no, guys are like, I need another trophy for my mantle. I'm like, this is my mantle. Like, I'm, I'm going to display other trophies on this trophy. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's huge, man. But so, so awesome, you know, to yeah. finally seal the deal. And as far as what's next for me, I'll fish some opens the next couple months. There's a Oregon Bass Nation put together like an Oregon Classic. It's actually yeah. going to be a really big event. They're giving away like 10 grand for a $200 entry fee as long as they hit cap on boats. And there's been guys pre-signed up and it's been capped for the last few weeks. So that's going to be phenomenal to stay inside state lines and fish for 10,000. That's massive. And then plus it's going to um, obviously being affiliated with Bass Nation, it's going to get you a bid to nationals. So I better figure out how to go win that one next. But where, where yeah. is that? It's at 10 Mile Lake, um, which okay. is probably the most prevalent tournament fishery in the state of Oregon. Um, okay. Awesome fishery. I hope they have a pro tour event there in the future because it would be the most dynamic fishery we've probably ever had one at. That's awesome, dude. I think something that I've learned um, and, and I'm so I'm in the Boise area in the Treasure Valley. And so I have learned just fishing a couple of these local lakes and stuff surrounding it and then further into North Idaho and into Washington and into Oregon. But like. I, I hate that the West has to deal with the drives. Like we just have such a distance between these bodies of water, but like, man, even like right across the border from me in Oregon, Lake Oahe, like, like, right. Like these, these bodies of water that are 40, 50 miles long that have the ability to have tournaments on that have incredible, like it, it's been a down year, I guess the last couple of years, but now it's caught a bunch of water. Like there's eight to nine pounders that swim in there. Like, yeah. they, like there's some cool bodies of water that I hope, with the BAM tour and additional tournament organizations, we see like some growth outside of kind of the traditional West coast, California, which I understand. And like, that's where the majority of anglers are on the West, but there's a lot of opportunity. I have always felt like to expand. And it's just a tough way to do it. A hundred percent. I mean, some of the fisheries we have, they're generally untapped. And unfortunately the ones like Oahe's and stuff like that, they just don't have the resources to cater to a giant tournament circuit, but where the pro tour platform is, 
you know, last year we got it up to like 60 boats, 55 boats or whatever. Um, and I know that that's Mark's intentions is to grow it. I don't know to what capacity, but I like that 50 boat threshold because we can go and fish some fisheries that are kind of overlooked. Like the next pro tour events at Lake Almanor first week yes. of June, which is like a super epic smallmouth fishery up in the really? you know, mountains of California. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's about a 50 boat size fishery. So we can go places like that. I mean, we've had pro tour events from the John day river to the Columbia river, and we just get to go expose some fisheries, Trinity Lake for that matter, that are like phenomenal fisheries. You couldn't have 150 boat pro am at, and we get to go do it against the highest caliber guys out West for a lot of money. And it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's the best. That's awesome. Yeah. So, and that's, that's something that was interesting to me looking at the, the different tours and, and to my, in my decisions on 2024 fishing wise, but like, as far as, as far as these, these bodies of water, right? Like, um, I hadn't heard of Lake Almanor outside of kind of previous pro tour stuff or what's the other one, uh, after Bay, right. Of where yeah. you guys are going to. So, so have you spent time on the rest, the, so the rest of the schedules, what, or Orville after Bay, um, uh, Almanor and then Columbia river. Yep. Correct. As far as, uh, and then back to the Delta for the championship in the fall. Yep. Okay. So ha have you been on all of those bodies of water before previously? Are you going to yeah. pre-practice any of those? What's your take on that? Yeah. So, um, I'll pre-practice some of those ones cause they're more in my wheelhouse mileage wise. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, fished a couple pro tour events at Almanor. I've got a top 10 there. I fished a couple pro tour events at the Columbia river and pro am. So I've got top tens and pro tour and pro ams up there. And I have fished a pro tour event at the after Bay. Um, I didn't get a top 10 when I was there, but I do plan to go down there. It's about four and a half hours for me. So I'll, I'll get some time, some volume on the water to kind of like inspect it and see, you know, more so what caters to my style. I don't practice like at this day and age, I've competed for so long. It's more about finding what accommodates me than just what mm -hmm. maybe even the winning strategy is. Like I can try to manipulate it in my favor um, with my strengths. Um, that'll be the main key. Finding water that I'm comfortable fishing is is my jam these days. Yeah, dude. I think that's just maturing as an angler. I for sure. certainly have struggled that way previously of like trying to, you know, especially in college fishing, going to Sam Rayburn and doing what they do on Sam Rayburn. And what I've learned is like, I do a lot better when I just try and find how I'm comfortable fishing on any yeah. body of water. Like I just feel more at home, you know, hundred percent. And that's, that was the thing that kind of happened at Martinez is like, I really didn't pay attention to what anyone was doing or saying or applying. And I just did what I like to do. And that's, that definitely pays dividends. You know, when I was younger and less mature, it's kind of like, Oh, this pattern, this bait, this, what I'm like, I don't really care. Cause like I use these things and like my style is very much so a style of extremes where I'm comfortable doing anything. This is my whole life. I've done it forever, but like, it's like massive swim baits and tiny finesse baits are my two most comfortable aspects. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I like, I like cranking. I like throwing top water and stuff too, but just it's, it's the extremes, it's big baits and little baits, which is kind of like a, you know, Western thing. That's totally. Like that's like the West like. coast mantra, man. Like For sure. Can, yeah. For sure. That's awesome. That's great. Well, dude, um, I certainly appreciate you taking the time out and coming on and, and, uh, sharing with everybody the, the win, the, uh, the inaugural event. That's, I guess the last question I have from a tournament perspective. This of course is, is fam kind of, like you said, passing on the torch. This is the first one. Um, what was your take from a media coverage standpoint? Um, from how the tournament was run, weigh-ins, all of that. I mean, bass fishing uh, anglers at any level, and it seems to actually be worse at club levels, in my opinion, sometimes than even at, at higher levels. But there is so much freaking drama, right, with yeah. bass fishing. And so much Dude. like, oh, this guy was doing this, then this guy was doing that. It's just like, this is ridiculous. But from your perspective, how was the event run? Yeah, and to be honest, man, I'm incredibly critical. I mean, I'm a customer of tournament organizations. I've been showing up to a lot of different circuits for a lot of years. Um, started fishing pro-ams in 2018. So it's not something that's brand new to me. And I fished uh, every other level, every stepping stone up to this point. And um, one thing I'll say about the band pro tour is when I look around and find any staff member, they are committed and passionate. And I know for a fact that if 
there's an impression that maybe it wasn't this aspect wasn't the best it could have been. They are trying as hard as I've ever seen anyone try. And that was like the most incredible note in hindsight. Every single staff member was so passionate and diligent about what they're trying to build. I haven't felt that in a long time. Um, as far as like keynotes for the angler side of things, it's the only circuit. It's one of the only circuits, one of the only, right? I better make sure um, that I put an asterisk there that, that will allow you to fish for a hundred percent payback. And so for me, I'm always looking at that, like, okay, is it 80% payback? Is it 90% payback? Is it a hundred percent payback? And I'm confident that Mark's payback is at a hundred percent, if not significantly above, um, He's working with a boat manufacturer for the championship to make sure that there's a boat to give away at the championship. He's got contingencies for, um, at this point in time, Bass Boat Technologies and Garmin. So he's networking really well with the uh, resources and sponsors of the organization to ensure that that payback is padded even more so. Um, he's incredibly transparent with the information as well as the payouts. Like I knew what 10th place check was before the end of the event, which is, uh, I've never seen that before. You know what I mean? I know it's available in some capacity. I knew what the winner was going to get before the event, you know, and they have the results available pretty much immediately. You don't have to wait all night, which out West there's sometimes we, you don't even know what place you're in going into the next day of competition. Um, you know, so it's available right away. He has the scoreboard on the live way in, you know what I mean? He's got, it sounds crazy, but like he's running commercials on the way in live feed, which is like, as an angler, I'm like, this is, progressive you know what i mean he's figured out ways that he can market the weigh-ins that's his background is marketing and media so to have a tournament owner director that has a background in the marketing and media side like that's really really massive obviously it's the bass angler magazine pro tour bass angler magazine i think has like you know thousands tens of thousands of subscribers on a national basis you know you can get them in stores you know so he's got a really solid platform in that aspect the media is fantastic there was a keynote after day day one in the morning where Mark asked uh, the anglers, did everybody get a camera boat yesterday? The fact that he was confident enough that everyone did, that he asked that at blast off and also was affording the opportunity to the anglers to see if they didn't, that was massive. Because in previous circuits, like you might get a few guys, camera boats here and there, it's kind of hard. Like I actually filmed myself this year because I was so worried about maybe not getting coverage but yeah halfway through day one you know there's not even service they idle over say hey how's it going i'm like it's going decent i'm catching some fish and then mark of all people is the one who jumps on the boat and is running the camera so what i'm seeing in terms of the staff is everyone is so committed to the growth of the organization they're so transparent with the paybacks and the information that i only see it getting bigger mm -hmm. um it was the first professional level event that I fished in the last three years that I got a check in the parking lot, even for the win. So I wait 15 or 20 minutes after everything's said and done, tons of media exposure, interviews, um, photographs, the whole nine. Um, he's networked in with the, um, you know, like common writers, like your Jody Only's, uh, David Brown's and stuff like that. So instantly, like my phone rings for two days after the victory, the first event, it seems like nobody would know, but boom, two days, phones ringing like crazy off the hook. Um, 15 minutes after my interviews are done, Mark's handing me a check in the parking lot and we're taking pictures. I, as an angler, like I couldn't ask for more. And realistically, is there going to be aspects and growing pains of like strategy and formatting? Of course. But at the end of the day, he's hit the mark so far ahead of where the pro tours out west started a few years ago that like i can't wait for the next event i mean it's really structured and progressive he's taken a lot of the things we didn't like about previous circuits eliminated them and pretty much listened to the anglers in terms of we want checks in the parking lot if we can get them we want the funds to be secured and good to go we want as much media as we possibly can get and you know he's really laying out the framework so i'm, I'm super um I guess pleased with my decision to to sign up and fish the tour and i was hesitant you know what i mean two months ago i was kind of hesitant i was like well you know i like the format i like the anglers it's a high caliber and the media seems promising but I'm, i don't want to put all my eggs in that basket and and i did you know and I'm, I'm really in hindsight thankful for that that's awesome man that's awesome well great well um i guess to wrap things up um super 
uh, I guess, excited to follow you in the next couple of events. And congrats on the win. How can folks follow along with you personally, fishing wise? Where can folks go to uh, to track your journey in the rest of 2024? Yeah. So um, my my most active platform is definitely Instagram. Handle yep. super easy, just like uh, down here, Colby Pearson Fishing. Oh. Um, I post on there very often. Um, I do have a Facebook page as well as a Facebook like a uh, business page, Colby Pearson Bass Fishing there. Um, I filmed most of this whole tournament and I'll be coming out with a video soon, just getting my YouTube channel restarted up and that'll, it's going to be a huge priority. Like the only thing I've spent money on after the event has been GoPro and filming accessories. Um, mm -hmm. So Colby Pearson Fishing on YouTube as well. And that'll be um, rolling really, really soon. So I'm very active on social media, pretty accessible. If you have questions or just want to see some big fish pictures, I'm posting on there all the time, um, especially like swim bait adventures and stuff like that when I'm back home. That's like my favorite thing to do. Love it. Love it. Awesome, man. Well, dude, thanks for taking the time out and uh, be sure to uh, certainly get you all the links when this show goes live. But appreciate it. Uh, cool basically breaking everything down are you going to fish the pro-am on the columbia yeah 100 percent. that's uh I'll, I'll show up to a couple pro-ams i fished the one bass shasta you know i'm going to go to the u.s open later this fall for sure that's an epic event i recommend yeah. everybody go to that um but i definitely will be at the bam uh, pro-am out of boardman mm -hmm. on the columbia river and that's yeah. going to be an epic event i really really hope the oregon and washington guys show up because they have a tendency maybe sometimes they don't so make sure you guys, if you're in the oh, Northwest, yeah, like yeah. not far. Like I'm, that's, like, I haven't been there at all. And, and, uh, I'm excited to, I'm going to fish that one. Uh, yes. here in it's three and a no, half it's hours. It's going to be awesome, man. We got the Idaho guys and the Washington and Oregon guys show up. I know there's going to be guys who show up from California. So make sure that as a unit, the Northwest is saying, Hey, we appreciate you fishing this tournament on our fishery and just show up and fish. If it's a co-angler, great. If it's a pro, even better, just mm -hmm. make sure you're there. Love it. Love it. Awesome, man. All right. Certainly cool. appreciate the time. Thanks, Colby. All right, man. See you later. Okay.